Good afternoon. Welcome to episode number 16 of the Zoom Town experiment. At this juncture, we've covered a lot of different issues with the Zoomy, specifically uh, the drive components as well as a lot of the sensors. So I think right now is really a good time to do a recap or a review to uh, cover what we've learned and what has changed since the original idea. So to do that, we are going to take a look at the function of each of the components, review each component's application for our use, look at potential problems, the cost so far, much more costs to come yet, but it's a good idea right now to review that cost. Why time evaluations were so important during our sensor testing. Distance traveled per millisecond. That's going to be a key element to everything we do once we start getting into the coding of this. We need to have a better understanding of power consum consumption because our power system is coming up in the next short series. And then finally, we'll wrap this up with what is next in the Zoom Town experiment. Let's just take a quick look at the Zoomy as it, ex as it stands right now. Uh, a couple of components are missing because they're not fastened in yet. Uh, but this would be the motor driver in this area. This is one of the power supplies back here for the motor driver. We've got the bottom deck. We've got our wheels. The wheels each have magnets in them for our encoders. On the bottom we've got a caster as our third wheel. You'll also notice we've got a time of flight sensor here, Hall effect sensors here and here, and two photoreflective sensors in this location. Down underneath our sensor bracket are the two motors. All of that is run through wiring harnesses that ultimately will end up on the logic level board. To get an idea of what we've really covered so far relative to the overall schematic for the entire Zoomy, we've covered the I2C devices for the AS5600 rotor encoders, there's two of them, our digital inputs will come from our Hall effect sensors, A3144s. I have space for a third one if needed. We've got our analog inputs coming from the two photoreflective sensors, which are TCRT 5000s, one for left, one for right, and a time of flight sensor, which is a sharp product. It is a model number gp 2 yo E03, and that's located on the front of the Zoomy. And finally, we have our motor drive for the two gear motors, which is a model TB6612FNG. Now, what is not yet covered is the actual Pico W and the power deck. The power deck will be our next short mini series. Tracking the costs is critical to this. The overall cost of this whole experiment is going to be a couple thousand dollars, probably closer to three thousand by the time I'm done, and that's if everything goes well. At this point, our costs are up around thirty-two dollars and thirteen cents. I'm sure it's a there's a little bit of gray number in there uh, until I get all completely done with this. Uh, but we got to remember that we got to multiply that times 16 because I think that'll be the maximum number of zoomies I'll have running around on the track or zoom town when we get to that stage. So I'm a little, little, little bit happy with the, the cost so far. Now don't mind the tiny construction workers. They're working on the road surfaces. They're pretty quiet, so we shouldn't have to be bothered by them. But let's start out with our photoreflective sensors. The photoreflective sensors are located on the front center of the Zoomy chassis, and their point, or how they will work, they're going to read this line 
based on how much light is reflected off of it. And what our job is in software is to read those two sensors. And if the values, the analog values being fed back to the Pico are the same, then the robot is right on center of that line. So it can follow along very straight. There will be some additional software controls in there. I may have to go with the PID routine, uh, proportional integral derivative, uh, but we'll see how that all plays out in the real world. But as mentioned, my original plan was to have just simply line following for all the straight moves. So as it's going along here, for example, when we get to turns going from here around the corner and such, that won't use line following. It would just get too cluttered with too many lines, and there's no way those sensors could work out all those details. Next up on the bottom are the Hall Effect sensors. And those are out here, and I'm going to put the zoomy right here. And you can see I've got a blue dot here and a red dot here. Now, my objective with that is, is so that when the zoomy comes along, there's two different things it's going to need to know. Once it gets to this point, when it sees the blue dot, it knows that is the end of this line. That's going to be very important for localization. The other thing that it will see is the red dot in certain locations, and that will be an indicator of a stop. So that is my road sign. Now at these two dotted locations, of course, I have to drill into the layout, putting my little tiny construction workers to work, and they will embed magnets in the road surface. Every line will have a blue dot at each end, such as here and here. That, of course, helps with the localization, I as I just mentioned. As you can imagine, as we come into this line, we will detect it here with the first magnet. In the database, it will know the distance from that dot to this dot, or that magnet to this magnet. So from that, it can tell approximately where it is in this entire layout. That will be a key element for localization. It's not foolproof, and it's not perfect, but it will be one of the tools we can use for the Zoomy to know exactly where it is on the layout. You will notice that depending on which way we're going, I'm going to position the blue dots always on the left side of our guide line. The guide line is the one that the line following uses. Our red dots on the right side of the line anytime I want the robot to stop at a stop sign per se. Also we have encoders on either side of our sensor bracket, one for each wheel. So as the robot or the zoomy gets to say this location, I can compare the difference between when I see that dot and this dot as I'm expecting and compare it against the motion that is made to see those two dots. That will tell me also that one, I've traveled the distance and it's been verified by the encoders on the wheels and the dots indicating the length. Now, the encoders are also very important for this next thing. So far, we know we can follow lines pretty accurately. That's a pretty tried and true system. But getting around corners, especially with multiple choices, we have to get to this location then we have to turn and pick up the line and continue on. Well, doing that completely blind can be a little troublesome. And that's where the encoders come in handy. I can verify that this wheel will turn X number of revolutions or so far, and it'll be more than this wheel. So as we make that turn, I can monitor those wheels to make sure we've made an accurate turn. So that's how we'll be monitoring turns, and we'll also use these encoders to help with localization as well. They will work in conjunction with my line start and line end markers. 
Another one of the things that we're going to have on the layout is a barrier, so to speak. We'll think of it as like a garage door. Now this is the driveway. So as the zoomy comes around, the corner, say it's coming from this direction, it'll turn right, and then it has to turn right to pull into the driveway. Now some of these will be very tight turns, and it may not be a perfect position there. So what we have to do then, as we're pulling in like this, we will use that forward-looking time-of-flight sensor to take a reading off of that garage door so that when we park, we don't actually bump into the residence or the building. And of course, a zoomie coming from the opposite way will be doing the same thing on this side. Now the time of flight sensor will also be used to detect if there's something in the path. So if this time of flight sensor sees this zoomy, one of the two better stop, or hopefully they both stop if they're on the same track heading towards each other. Another way that this sensor is going to be used is for collision avoidance to not hit this particular zoomy. If this zoomy is coming this way, remember this is America, we're right hand drive, and this zoomy is going in this direction, if this sensor sees something in the path, for example this barrier, we want it to stop. What I don't know yet is due to the, the fanning or the spread of that signal as it sends the light beam out and sees it coming back, I don't know how it's going to behave in certain situations on the actual layout. This might be far enough apart where it won't see each other, but we won't know until we get into practical testing. Another area that's going to be problematic will be as we go around turns. Now this zoomy could be coming in this direction. This one can be going around the turn this way. Of course that forward-looking sensor is going to see this zoomy. And it's all perfectly acceptable because this zoomy will also be turning around the corner this way. That's going to be one of the major challenges I have to work out in code uh, and I don't yet have a solution for that. So that's going to be one I have to noodle on for quite a while before we get good, reliable, and predictable results. That's, by the way, that's just one of the many major problems coming up as we go through this whole process of the Zoomtown experiment. Any project that involves motion, you have to take into account position and time. Uh, as you can imagine, if we're doing calculations based on sensor feedback, by the time that sensor takes the reading and we get it back to the logic to process that information, time has passed. The longer that time, the more inaccurate your data is. So this becomes a very important driving factor in everything you do with motion control. And it's going to be a very controlling factor in how I'm going to design the software to run the Zoomy. Here's a simple little spreadsheet to deal with the motion and time issue. Our wheel diameter is 1.56 inches, our motor RPM is 100. With that I can very easily calculate how many inches a minute the zoomy can move, which is 490, which works out to inches per second, or 8.17 inches per second. Uh, one of the fun facts is it'll take 11 and 3 quarters of a second to go from one end of the layout to the opposite end. That's 96 inches. Moving on to the next two important aspects is the distance per millisecond that the zoomy will travel. We're going to have to do a lot of calculations and we can't work in time durations of a minute or even a second. It's got to be broken down into much finer granularity or fine, finer time slices. So right now I'm focusing on everything to do with motion and time at a millisecond. 
So at uh, the distance the Zumi can travel at full speed is 0.08 inches, a little more than a sixteenth of an inch. Over in the metric system, that would be 2.07 millimeters, so 80 thousandths of an inch. That may seem like a lot or it may not seem like a lot, depending on your perspective. But we have to pay attention to that, because at any event that's going to take longer than a millisecond, there will be a distance traveled greater than two millimeters. And that's where this gets to be very important. And which is also why we've paid a lot of attention to processing time for a lot of the sensors, how long it took to read them. And if you recall, uh, back in a couple of them, we actually had to eliminate them from application because it simply took too long to get the sensor reading and process the data. Looking here at my next spreadsheet, which was what I used to track and record all of these uh, cycle times for the various sensors. Now the two that are red flagged down here, we've got the read the color sensor and then read the time of flight. That's not the current one that we're using, the sharp, but the other one. That would have taken 28 and a half milliseconds for just those two sensors. That's a long time. So we took a different path, looked for other sensors, alternative sensors that can perform the same function but take less time to read and process the data. Now we've chosen the TCRT5000 photo reflective sensor that takes 0.22 milliseconds to read and process. My Hall effect sensors that I've picked out are 0.03 milliseconds. That is very very fast. The AS5600 encoders take a, a half a millisecond or 0.5 milliseconds, and then the GP2YOE03 time of flight sharp sensor is taking 0.16 milliseconds to read and process the data. Now there's multiple sensors and some applications here. Uh, the first three, we've got two of each, and then finally the time of flight sensor, just one. So we work out how much time all those sensors take to be read and processed. And it works out to 1.65 milliseconds. Now that's just to read the sensors. There's a whole lot of other stuff that we got to do within a process loop in our code. Now, right now, just so you get a little better perspective, if you're not familiar with milliseconds and time, if my time is less than two milliseconds, 500 times per second, I can process those sensors, which is pretty fast. But even at two milliseconds, we are now at four millimeters of travel distance. See how this can be very important as to what we're doing? Because if it takes me more than two milliseconds, all of a sudden, my zoomies moving much further and much greater potential for it to bump into something or for things to be too late to do anything about. So processing time is very, very critical. Another thing that we had to really pay attention to throughout this part of the process to figure out how much power consumption there will be, because the next phase is our battery system or our power supply. If this thing's sucking up 10 amps and I can only put in a one amp battery, well, we're not going to have a lot of runtime. That isn't what I wanted to run into. Uh, so I went through, some of this is theoretical, some of it's practical. In truth, it all won't be practical until it's running in a system. So for right now, I'd say it's more than a wild guess, but it's an educated guess at this point. Uh, what we'll do, we'll just take a quick look at the various items, and uh, the most important is to look at the nominal peak uh, current draws. Realistically, we're not going to be hitting a lot of peak, even off the motor, unless the Zumi is stalled on something, even the motors won't be drawing peak power for any duration. But the Pico is estimated to take about 30 milliamps. 
marker LEDs, which will be a front and a rear LED on the Zoomy, primarily just for uh, mm -hmm. feedback while it's traveling around so I can recognize a problem. Uh, maybe if it's flashing red or something like that, or if it's flashing green, all is good. Something to that effect, just so it's easy for me to observe as I'm controlling the system. The motor drive only pulls about 5 milliamps. That's not counting the current being pulled by the motor. The N20 gear motors, there's two of them for a total of 280 milliamps, which, relatively speaking, for the power that I'm getting out of them and the performance, I think that's quite low, so I was real happy with that. At a full peak stall current, it's still only 860 milliamps. The photoreflective sensors are pulling 90 milliamps. The Hall effect sensor is 10, and the AS5600 encoder modules are only pulling uh, 13. And keep in mind, this is the this column here is taking into account the quantity of those sensors. So for our nominal column, we would be pulling about 470 milliamps, and every if everything was peaked out, a little over a full amp. So the batteries that I'm working with uh, that I've selected are 18650s. I'm going to have two of them in series, and that capacity should be about 3, 000, 3 milliamp hours. And uh, I think we're going to be in pretty good shape there. I've been working with a number of 18650s, and I know I can get higher capacities as well. But even at this, we're at 6.4 hours of runtime. So based on all this information, I think we're in pretty good shape. And even if we're running more, even at peak currents on everything, it's 2.8 hours of runtime. That I'm pretty happy with. So with all that covered, you might be asking, well, what's next? Well, we know that we're still I'm call, in what I call phase one of the project. That's getting the Zoomy up to the uh, functionality that I can start uh, doing coding and testing and so forth. So to finish up this phase, we need to implement a power system, which I've already alluded to, and that's coming up next. Then we need to get our logic control system in place, which would be, uh, for lack of a more elegant way of putting it, it'll be the Pico W with an interface circuit board, a custom designed circuit board, to make it easy for all these interconnections. And then finally, finishing up whatever's left on the mechanical build. Now, uh, after we get done with phase one, I want the Zoomy to be as ready as possibly can be to go into code development. Most likely we're going to find more problems throughout the build process and testing process, and I may have to go backwards and reevaluate other sensors, etc. So I'm, I'm preparing for everything as an eventuality here. Uh, but moving into phase number two, that'll primarily be uh, all about uh, developing the code step by step and testing it out as far as we can in each of those phases. That's going to take a lot of time. We want it to be robust so that when we get into the system running automatically, we're not fiddling around with a lot of these other little issues. And that'll wrap up this episode. In the next episode, number 17, we're going to be taking a look at the power supply system, primarily the battery container or battery holder, which is a custom unit. I look forward to seeing you next week.